We came to Australia for the Wine Media Conference in the Hunter Valley. Sitting west of the main section of the Hunter Valley, you will find the subregion of Broke Fordwich. It's a little quieter here than in Polkabam, where so many of the big wineries are located. Travel south from the village of Broke on Wollombi Road. There you will find Creeplewood. Let's go for Wanda. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> and well, actually, I thought what we'd do is we'd just go for Wanda down around to the and, and down around the vineyard and then back up. That sounds great. Chat on the way. That sounds perfect. The varieties we've planted, we've provided, we've planted Semillon, Chardonnay, um, Badello and Shiraz. Uh -huh. And we've also got some Champignon planted and um, we've, we've also got um, Gewurz Tramina, uh -huh. which is actually a small portion, which um, I wanted to use and I couldn't find anyone that I could buy some smaller fruit off because uh, right. we just planted some ourselves and we've and, and, and it's working really well for us. I was keen to actually add it to um, the, the Vidello to sort of like make yeah. it a little bit more savoury. Yeah. And we also do a one called Wild White, which is um, made, the wines are all free run uh, wines and the white ones, and but with the, um, our, our Wild White is um, the pressings of the Chardonnay or the Vidello and Semillon, and boom, a, a dollop of uh, Gewurz, and it ah. sort of just really yeah. makes a great thing. They had Mouvet, but it didn't do well, so they pulled that out and planted Tempranillo, which does very well here. They do need to show some of the varieties a little extra care in this climate. Tempranillo is susceptible to downy mildews. They are careful to leaf pull and keep the canopy open for airflow. With their Semillon, which is famous for Botrytis in Bordeaux, they carefully drop fruit to keep the bunches from touching and developing disease. We used to make um, get our wine made by a contract winemaker, so right. we'd, we'd grow the grapes and take them away. Yeah. And we felt that we weren't really the real deal until we grew the grapes mm -hmm. and made the wine here. There so you go. We built um, the winery down here, which my the blokes sort of refer to uh, jokingly as the little Bunnings, because you know, <laughs> it's a grey building here. Oh so. yeah. <laughs> The flow forms and tanks are for making the biodynamic teas, which are used in the vineyard. They also have a patch where they bury their cow horns for two of the biodynamic preparations that they use. Biodynamics is really all about having a self-sustaining farm. The preparations are used in lieu of pesticides and fertilizers. These are made from plants grown in the vineyard and from manure from the cows on the property. They use these natural preparations rather than something brought in that was chemically made in a factory somewhere. Rod is well read on the subject of biodynamics and rattled off a series of books and authors that he had taken inspiration from. These range from microbiologists to biodynamic agriculture specialists to a scientist whose focus is on plant frequencies. Getting an understanding of um, the, the biology that you've got, benef you know, like beneficial um, critters in your, in, your, in your compost or your compost tea, um, and even doing things like measuring the um, um, biological coverage on a, on a leaf. You know, you, we send it away to a lab, and if you got, you got say, if you get up to about 80% biological coverage on your leaf, uh, um, the nasties won't attack it. You know. Rod tells me that they check the bricks levels in the stems. If the level gets to 16 to 18 bricks, pests won't attack it. Pests are predators, and they look for weak plants to attack. This is where he refers to the work of Philip Callahan, who studied the frequencies that plants give off. The frequency, when a plant is not healthy, can be picked up by pests who will then attack. We get into a conversation about the difficulties using biodynamic methods when you have summer rain. At this point, Rod has a story for me. All right, now my little story. Okay. Uh, yeah, so it's sort of, uh, we've been going in, we started, we started first using biodynamic uh, here, biodynamic preparations in 2002, and and um, and we got to 2008, and and uh, the local college and other other contractors would say, you know, like that's just the drought, you know, like, and it's sort of a uh, 2008 came and it pissed down raining the whole vintage, and 
we, we, we were going, oh, God, this, look, there's downy sort of starting to break out. And we, what were we doing? We, um, Lawson that worked for me at the time was really an awesome guy. And, and um, we'd found through um, going to different agricultural days, um, we, we met up with some guys in the cotton industry that were really keen on, on heading down the organic, which is very anti-organic -chem, camp cotton. And this guy was breeding um, species or genii of, of fungi that he said that would predate predated on downy spores. So we got this, we got some of that from him, and we made a compost tea with that. Yeah. And we bred them up, the numbers up, and we sprayed this out. And we actually we managed survive the whole year with downy and picked every grape on the property. And what it did was it sort of this this compost tea we sprayed out was. Would, was would the, the downy spores were like white underneath the leaf. Mm -hmm. They just sort of turned them like a red, rusty colour, and we managed it. And and, and so we we thought, yay! If, and it was a biodynamic head that sort of um, just we didn't want to give up. We'd been going for so many years, and there's so many people that have actually started doing it. And the first the first rainy couple of days, and they're back into the chemical shed, you know. Right. We're convinced now we can actually wave the flag. We're biodynamic, you know, because we actually survived. Yeah. So, so it's just a matter of actually having the will and the passion to sort of yeah. fight your way through it. Yeah. yeah. So, and you can't do it. You can't employ. You can't employ the passion, and you can't employ the the, the energy to actually to see it through. Yeah. Yeah. What blocks are we looking at here? What grapes These are, are the, these? Uh, Verdello. 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 There's Shiraz. Gotcha. Shiraz um, in front of us. And it goes. Um, Dello and then Chard uh, um, Gewurz and then Chardonnay and then Semillon right next to the creek. Gotcha. And we've got Shiraz here and we've got Shiraz over there and Shiraz and Tempranillo up the, up the top there. Gotcha. Do you have yeah. water rights that you can pull from the creek um, for some we, of your We do. We, well, we've got a dam here and, oh. and we, we drip feed to, for the for the, um, for the for the for the grapes from the dam. Right. And. Um, we we use we use the water to actually basically create the right um, microclimate for the biology. You know, gotcha. So there's moisture. We do not use the the water to actually boost the yield. They mostly use their irrigation to deliver fish emulsion, kelp, and molasses as a biological food. They do irrigate here, but just enough to keep the soil moist enough to keep the biology alive and breeding. At this point, we see a tractor with a spray unit coming toward us. They have a recovery unit built in so that the excess doesn't just blow away. This early in the spring, the vines are not yet lush, so there are fewer leaves to spray. They recover up to 80% of the spray. And actually, what a lot of people, conventional viticulture, uh, can't sort of quite handle is to sort of look down the vineyard and see grass and weeds and mm -hmm. things like that, which actually... Uh, Cover crops. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, it sort of allows all the natural predators and hoverflies and all that sort of thing. Even ladybirds, I mean, ladybirds are prolific at the moment, but um, in some vintages where we've had contractors in here, um, they'll, they'll, they'll be covered they'll be covered in the ladybirds and things, whereas the other ones, there's, they realise there's a difference that there's none there. And we've got, you know, the weeds around the trunks and that will actually act like a little motel for those critters and they come out when um, spring comes and up they come and mm -hmm. do their job and um, because they've got an environment that encourages them to be there. Right. 